I'm David Torsivia. I'm Daniel Forkner. And this is Ashes, Ashes, a show about systemic issues, cracks in civilization, collapse of the environment, and if we're unlucky, the end of the world. But if we learn from all of this, maybe we can stop that. The world might be broken, but it doesn't have to be. In July 2008, a meeting of the G8 was convened, and together these countries directed the World Bank to create a new arm dedicated to the financing of projects to help combat climate change. These climate investment funds received an initial $6.5 billion, some of which was merely redirected from other national aid programs at the time. And one of the two funds that were created is called the Clean Technology Fund dedicated to the development of low-carbon emission technologies around the world. And one year after this meeting, this new fund was financing the construction of a wind park on the Isthmus of Tehuantepec in the Mexican state of Oaxaca. The 27 wind turbines together would produce 67.5 megawatts of energy, enough to power 160,000 homes. And its profitability would help kick off additional mega clean energy projects that would cause Oaxaca's wind power generation to soar upwards to between 2,000 and 4,000 megawatts by 2018. In fact, today some 90% of all wind power generation in Mexico is sourced from the isthmus. And it's estimated that a total 10,000 megawatts of wind energy is possible in this location. Okay, so that's it. That's our show for this week. Thanks for tuning in. Renewable technology can be a big success when the world comes together to fund it. I'm glad you all listened. That's right, David. That, uh, that, that'll do it for the week. Oh, oh wait, hold on. Wait, I, I think... Can you pull out hold the on. notes for a second, Daniel? This seems short. Yeah, hold on one second. Yeah, okay, hold on, David. Uh, my notes are telling me there's a bit more to the story. Um, so let's look at this real quick. Okay. Um, in Mexico, power supply and generation for the longest time had been owned and controlled primarily by the state. This arrangement had been enshrined in the constitution, although foreign companies had been allowed to operate within the country under service contracts and in limited situations. A new wave of liberalization has taken hold, however, and last year the government began opening its oil and gas market up to private investment. But that was not the case in 2009. And so the World Bank had to figure out a crafty way to not just finance this wind park, but allow private companies to profit from its creation as well. And this was done through a legal loophole that said companies in Mexico could control the distribution of energy production if they were responsible for creating it and if they used it for their own purposes. So here's what they did. First of all, the wind park is owned almost entirely, 99% by a French utility company called Electricity de France. But Walmart bought a few shares in the project, so less than 1%, and through this arrangement, the French utility company was able to sell every single watt of energy from this project directly at a discounted rate to Walmart. That's right, in a state in which 7% of the entire population is completely without power, and through funding, By an international fund dedicated to ostensibly combating climate change, a wind farm was constructed by bulldozing over 361 hectares of community lands and the villages of indigenous people. And then that power was sold exclusively to Walmart's 350 stores, its wholesale stores and restaurants. The region that produces the most power in Mexico simultaneously has the deepest power inequality. And just a couple more details about this project. A subsidiary of this French utility company was granted a contract for the performance of peripheral maintenance services. And for that, the company eventually was paid $2 million a year, which is four times greater than the market price for similar maintenance contracts. And because of this trumped up contract, in addition to exaggerations about how much the project was costing in loans, It was able to qualify for carbon credits through the clean development mechanism, which came out of the Kyoto Protocol. This meant that the French utility company received some 1.2 million carbon credits and a potential $40 million in additional subsidies directly into their pockets. And so to be clear, those 1.2 million carbon credits they received 
gave this utility company the right to emit 1.2 million tons of CO2 and other greenhouse gases back home in the EU. But the grifting doesn't end in just these subsidies, Daniel. This project was supposed to be able to generate hundreds of local jobs. But of course, all the high-skilled work, and therefore most of the high-paying work, was not given to locals, but rather to American contractors. Unsurprisingly, the construction was preceded with lies to locals about how much they would receive in compensation for their land and contracts that ultimately prevent locals from even growing their own food, among other things. But at this point, those things should not surprise any of you. Which brings us to the main topic of this episode, and that's renewable energy and some of the uncomfortable realities of so-called green technology that become hidden from view by the fervor of vague ideas about wind farms and solar panels. Here's a quote from one of the locals in Oaxaca trying to defend their land. We don't think in the same way. The tradesman's vision is buy, 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 buy. But here, we don't buy everything. There are things that the farmers, the women and men have and can get from the land and live from. It's another vision. They come along and say to us, you have the wind here, so you have the obligation to contribute to reducing climate change. We didn't contribute to climate change. The corporates, they're the ones who caused climate change. And now the same companies are the ones with the solutions in their hands. They have the solution in these farms, producing renewable energy. Really, it's paradoxical. So let's look at some of these paradoxes. When energy production overall increases, new renewable sources that do not directly result in the closing of non-renewable sources don't actually end up curbing emissions. And this is no secret. In fact, one industry report said, quote, investing in new renewable power is not the same as making overall electricity production cleaner if the overall energy mix does not significantly alter. And then there's another paradox going on in terms of how this energy is used. One of the USAID officials who oversaw this project said, this will enable Mexico to greatly increase its exports and provides an incentive to develop power projects, end quote. And so when renewable energy technology is used to fuel the growth of private business, as this wind farm was done for Walmart, and when renewable energy is used to fuel the growth of industry and export-led development, as wind power has done for Oaxaca broadly, and as that USAID official admits here, when these projects are used as ways to grab land away from locals and then deny them access to that very power, and when all this results in carbon credits for private businesses to then dump emissions elsewhere, we have a contradiction of everything that a renewable technology represents. This region of Mexico, the southern part, is one of the best sites in the world for wind power generation. And the project we discussed represents just one of over 20 that have been built so far, and over double that which are planned. And the mapping that has been going on in the region to locate the best sites for wind energy has gone hand in hand with mapping for oil and gas extraction sites and has opened the door to the planning and construction of mega fossil fuel energy projects and the development of even more industry. And because international companies can invest in the area, clean energy represents a way to speculate and profit off climate change, where companies are giving massive subsidies and carbon credits to build low-risk projects in developing regions like Oaxaca, where profit is guaranteed, but those carbon credits, which can be then sold to other companies, become more valuable as climate change gets worse. It's the perfect way for energy companies to hedge their risk and continue non-renewable production at home. And it goes without saying, but along with all this development is the destruction of ecosystems, human rights abuses aimed at locals defending their land, and even the destruction of important archaeological sites. Yeah, it's really a, a racket when you start looking at the details. I mean, companies like this French utility company, they plan these projects that would be profitable in their own right based on the contracts that they set up. But then they say, hey, if we pro forma these really high costs, in this case by inflating the contract amount they're paying to a subsidiary of their own company, and if they overestimate the amount they're going to be paying in loans, then they can go to these international bodies and say, hey, we want to develop this green technology that's going to save the world, but we just don't have the financial incentive to do it. Can you give us a favorable loan? Can you give us some carbon credits so that we can save the world? And that's what they get. It's really uh, double dipping. 
And it's, it's extremely destructive, especially as we're talking about when it leads to this fossil fuel dependent growth of industry. And maybe at this point, David, we need to hit the brakes because I feel like we're getting into a perfect opportunity for the ashes, ashes critic out there to say, look, th- these guys on ashes, ashes are nothing but negative. Here we are facing the greatest threat to life on earth, which people are waking up to with movements like Earth Strike and Extinction Rebellion picking up steam. And this crisis has been recognized by the International Panel on Climate Change and governments all over the world that if we don't do something to curb our carbon emissions fast, we're all doomed. And here these guys are going to sit up here and try and tell us that renewable technology is terrible. Well, before you go down that road, listener, we want to be clear and address a concept that normally we would probably have left towards the end. The fact that technology for renewable energy is quite simply beautiful. And a sustainable future depends on our ability to utilize these technologies. But when we look at a solar panel and we say, how can we take this technology for capturing the sun's energy and then use it to keep our economies growing, to keep the rate of industrialization accelerating, to increase the number of jets we have circumventing the globe, to keep these massive cargo ships delivering crate after crate of useless electronic knickknack bullshit, well, then we have grossly bastardized everything that this technology stands for. A renewable future will not be created by some quick fix innovation that allows the status quo to continue. A renewable future involves more than technology. It has to include a total transformation of our political, economic, and social institutions, our ways of relating to the earth and ultimately to each other. To put it in practical terms, From an article, quote, in November, a joint venture of Vestas, the world's largest maker of wind turbines, and MHI, a unit of Mitsubishi, announced that it would provide 23 of its new biggest turbines to a project in the Belgian North Sea. The massive turbines can power 137,000 German homes, the company said. Uh, Which sounds pretty great, right, David? Yeah, that's a a good number. That's a a positive move towards more renewable energy. 137,000 homes. Yet at the same time, the number of German homes that were constructed grew by 245,000 in the same year. So that's the paradox we are in. If we are using renewables as a way to keep this party going, the party that is our economy of infinite growth, then the demand we are placing on the earth will simply continue to outpace whatever mitigating effects we think this technology is having. To bring it back to Oaxaca, if we are building wind farms just so that we can expand industry, we're not really deploying carbon neutral solutions because that industry itself is going to drive increased demand on fossil fuels through the trucks, ships, factories, roads, and everything else that needs to be built and put into service for that industry to profit. And as we'll get to, there are certain sectors of our economy that are much harder to decarbonize than others. And this helps explain the data that despite the world's enthusiasm the past few decades for developing so-called clean technology, solar panels, and all that, 2018 saw the highest level of global greenhouse gas emissions in human history. We have a broken system. And adding solar panels to this broken system won't change that. From Stephen Mufson, quote, Royal Dutch Shell Chief Executive noted in 2014 that solar and wind provide about 1% of the world's energy. How on earth do we think that 1% is going to become 90% of a system that will be twice as big as what it is by the middle of the century? It won't happen. Even with large advances in renewable energy, he said, the share of world energy met by oil and gas would decline from 85% to 75% by the middle of the century, a time when the IPCC said net carbon dioxide emissions should drop to zero. I think the real challenge is not so much how do we accelerate renewables, but more about how do we decarbonize the system we have, Van Bearden said. That's really the heart of this issue, David, is that if we truly want to decarbonize the system we have, that means looking well beyond just our technology for energy and towards ways to transform the economy itself. I think this is the really important point to take away from this episode. And we're doing this early on because it is the core of this idea. Like we said, we're really excited about all these green technologies. The future is absolutely one that is going to have to be built on decarbonized technology. So that's solar panels, wind farms, hydroelectric, all sorts of different types of tech that does not emit carbon dioxide 
into the atmosphere. That's a requirement. We have no other choice. But we're not going to get to that point if we continue to grow our economy. And if we continue to grow our economy on that affordable, high energy, energy dense fossil fuel that we have become so reliant on over the past 150, 200 years. It's not a change of technology that's going to save us, but rather a slow evolution of the technology we already have, but drastic increases in the way that we live our lives and structure the global economy and everything down to the local economy as well. Here's uh, Julia Adney Thomas, who's writing from the University of Notre Dame. And she says, quote, slowing climate change is crucial, but navigating its challenges is only possible if it is understood as one facet of planetary overshoot. The challenges of our altered, unpredictable Earth system cannot be met by technological tinkering within the very system that pushed it over the edge in the first place. There's nothing for it but to roll up our sleeves and begin the hard work of transforming our political and economic systems with the aims of decency and resilience. End quote. Um, before we get into a little bit more of the technical side of, of the challenges with renewable technology, David, I want to come back to this concept that we kind of hit on in various episodes about the need for us as individuals to live smaller. That if we're going to enter a renewable future, a sustainable future, we're all going to have to become accustomed to living with less. It means maybe less driving, maybe less meat consumption, right? Less world travel, you know, less flying around the world. And I think this is something that gets people hung up a lot because they look at their own individual life. They say, I'm going to have to make all these changes. Well, my neighbor, if they decide not to, they just keep on living their lives. And now I'm suffering and they're reaping the benefits of my sacrifices. And this line of thinking, this perspective is kind of a symptom of this very individualized way of looking at the world that has kind of been a product of our consumer economy. And I was talking to someone the other day and they mentioned this uh, luxury service that is available to many of the moderately rich people of the world. And I looked it up. There's a company, David, that offers wardrobe shipment for rich people. They come to your house or, or whatever, and they take an inventory of all the clothing, all the shoes, all the accessories, all the coats that you own. And then they make a database of every item that you have. And then anytime you want to travel somewhere, you want to visit your second home, they will quite literally take your wardrobe, ship it, clean it. And before you get to your location, <laughs> they set it up in your closet or your hotel room or wherever it is you're going. Um, there's one company called Garden Robe, and I found some of their marketing material where they say, quote, Garden Robe pioneered the luxury wardrobe management and cyber closet valet concept to service the needs of couture collectors, city residents with inadequate closet space, business travelers, globe trotters, multiple homeowners, and fashion designers. The only service of its kind, Garden Robe's attraction is museum quality garment storage for its members' precious clothing, footwear, furs, and accessories collections, and providing on demand accessibility whenever, wherever. And I want to propose something. Why don't we just start there, right? As a society, as people who have the power to uh, encourage policies, what if we looked at our world today and said, how many businesses out there are providing services? and goods that are nothing but wasteful. Instead of seeing the challenge of making individual decisions in our own life, we could all work together and maybe get rid of the ability for some of these types of businesses that are wasting fossil fuels, flying people's wardrobes all around the world. I mean, to end a business practice like that would probably do more in terms of saving on energy than if every single American shaved two minutes off their shower time. Yeah, Daniel, we've talked about some of these concepts before and how so much of this waste and energy use, and ultimately because of that, the pollution is coming from a very small group of people up at the top, and they very much dominate their contribution to climate change globally, and we all have to deal with the consequences of that. And while, yes, we will always hear about how we need to take up our own personal responsibility by shaving our showers shorter, 
by recycling, trying to shift this guilt from those who are wealthy and in control or who have these businesses that contributed to these problems in the first place unto us, the lowly individual. There are things we can do, like Daniel is mentioning, where we can very quickly legislate away some of these problems. And it's going to hurt all of us in the process, but it's going to hurt some people a lot more. But that's what democracy is. It gives us the ability to say, hey, you know, for the better sake of all of us, we need to step in and make some hard sacrifices for, I mean, I guess in this case, some of you at the top. And if we had a functioning democracy, then that would be simple for us to do. But because in large parts it's controlled by those people at the top who have the money and wealth and power, uh, that's easier said than done. But maybe uh, we're getting a little off topic with that idea. Yeah, so, something to think about as we go through this episode. But I guess let's bring this conversation, David, back to the more technical side of renewable technology, because we don't have to go that far down this idea to see evidence that green technology is simply not up for the job of replacing all sources of production on our grids, assuming this status quo economics. And you mentioned something a little bit ago about energy density. And this is an important concept to help wrap your mind around some of the limits to the technology that is going to fuel our civilization of the future. Okay, yeah, that's a good idea, Daniel. Let's talk about energy density and, and look at it from sort of a historical perspective. So before we turned oil into fuel for combustion, energy came either through direct physical labor, like uh, you're traveling on foot or riding a bicycle, or you have the aid of some sort of animal like a horse or an oxen, or it came from the Earth's energy flows. So that would be something like the wind that creates a force that pushes a sailing ship ahead or the flow of a river that turns a water mill. And all of these energy flows are constantly, ultimately, being powered by the sun. A mule working on a farm, for example, is powered by the solar energy stored in the vegetables it eats. The wind for that sailing ship is caused by temperature differentiations caused by the sun, ultimately. And even that water, while yes, it is gravity that's pushing it down there, the way that the water got up the hill in the first place was through evaporation from the sun. The sun is the ultimate source of power for all of this energy movement. Fossil fuels, then, being a concentrated plant and animal material, are basically a giant battery of stored solar energy that has been accumulated over hundreds of millions of years. And to put this in perspective, one ton of coal is the equivalent of 13 tons of fossilized organic matter. But it gets even more concentrated than coal. One ton of oil, for example, is equal to 120 tons of fossilized organic matter. And so to help visualize this, Buckminster Fuller coined the term energy slave, which is similar to horsepower, but measured in terms of the amount of work a human is capable of expending. And then comparing that to the amount of work we derive from the stored energy of fossil fuels or any other non-human source. So if you were to put in 2,000 hours of exercise this year on a cycling machine or a rowing machine, you know, really getting after that New Year's resolution, you would produce about the same amount of energy that we can derive from just 3.7 gallons of gasoline or 14 liters. And so for a car with a 16 gallon or 60 liter tank, going from empty to full is the energy equivalent of one human doing maximum physical work for 48 straight months or 48 humans working in a single month. And so he would call that 16 gallon tank the equivalent of 48 energy slaves, for example. And the point of this illustration is the recognition that modern civilization built in just the past couple hundred years or if you want to consider the moment the U.S. began its massive highway construction, then we're looking at just the past 65 years or so. That civilization that we have built cannot be managed and it cannot be run and maintained on the work output of humans and animals. Because you could drive your car to the mall and back and in that one trip expend more energy than a human could in an entire year. And so that's kind of why energy density is so important and what has enabled so much economic growth over the past couple hundred years, because we've kind of unleashed this giant battery, as you put it, David, stored in the Earth's crust. And batteries are a really great way to think about it, Daniel. But like all batteries, eventually they run out and they get less efficient as time goes on. And that's something that we've started to see happen in the way that we use fossil fuels now. 
You mentioned our economic growth, Daniel, and I think that's where this story gets really interesting here because it is important to understand that that growth has not just been a result of cheap energy being available, but it has been premised on the assumption that the availability and the density of energy will continue to rise. As we mentioned, oil has a higher energy density than coal, which has a higher energy density than wood, which has a higher energy density than just raw plant matter. At every shift in the paradigm of energy use, we have exploited either higher density energy or a greater availability of energy in order to expand our global footprint. That is to say, build taller buildings, build more roads, build more powerful engines. But renewable energy technology represents a massive decline in energy density that we use to power our civilization. According to one paper from the International Journal of Green Energy, if you look at energy density alone, quote, Gasoline is 10 quadrillion times more energy dense than solar radiation, 1 billion times more energy dense than wind and water power, and 10 million times more energy dense than human power. And I think that really does a great job illustrating just how big this gulf that we're going to have to cross with our energy use is. Well, and it also really conveys the idea that our modern civilization cannot be sustained on a resource with a lower energy density than what we're used to. These concepts about energy density and how they relate to the way civilization is built are very popular in certain areas of energy theory. Uh, You've seen a lot online over the past decade or two with the peak oil community, uh, which is not what this show is about. Uh, That is its own very long, lengthy, complicated area of conversation. We're not going to get into that. But one thing they did come out of that is the idea of EROEI, or Energy Returned on Energy Invested. And basically, the idea is that in the past, when we first started extracting these very easy-to-extract oil and fossil fuel reserves, we got a lot of energy out of this for every little bit of energy we'd put in. So basically, it was very easy to mine this. I think one of the first oil wells to mine was only like 20 or 30 meters underground, and then oil was coming out of the earth. It's very simple. But now we have very complicated and energy-intensive ways of extracting that same amount of oil. We have to drill down thousands of meters, oftentimes in very remote places, get that oil out, move it to where it needs to be. And all that energy we ultimately pull out, we had to put that much more energy in to get it out. And so the efficiency of this process and therefore the practical economic energy density has decreased. And as this decreases, we have to exploit more energy in order to make up for that gap. And we get into this sort of vicious loop that continues and makes economic growth harder in the process. So if we're constantly trying to increase our economic growth with what is ultimately less and less efficient energy supplies, then eventually we're going to come to this slowing point and then fall off this cliff. That's the peak oil theory. But this sort of larger idea can be carried also to the different types of energy and power generation that we have, whether it's solar panel, whether it's wind power. Some are more efficient than others. Uh, Wind power can have 20 to 50 times uh, EROEI, depending on what type of study you're looking at, where it's put, what type of windmill, how large they are. There's a lot of different variables, and it's really hard to nail all this stuff down. If you want to read more about it, there are communities who spend all their time online discussing this. We encourage you to check it out. But that concept that we have to put energy in to extract energy and the efficiency of that process is something that's very important in this larger concept of renewable energy, of replacing our energy generation systems, and of what that means for how we live our lives and build our civilization on a very grand scale. And it's important to understand how EROEI is kind of tied up with market forces and and economics, where like you mentioned, the first oil well in the United States was something like 30 meters underground. Compare that to the deep water horizon of the Gulf of Mexico, which begins 1,500 meters underwater or roughly a mile. And then once it hits the ocean floor, extends 4,000 meters down into the, into the Earth's crust just to get enough oil that if you were to use it all up in one go, would power the entire globe for about 12 hours. And we hear a lot about fracking these days and how technological innovation has opened the door to these new energy extraction methods. But in reality, the technology for fracking has been around for a long time and it was always technically feasible. But what made it a economic reality was the fact that all those shallow wells dried up and the cost for getting that additional barrel of oil rose to the point where it actually made economic sense to invest billions of dollars into the technologies for shale rock oil and gas extraction. But these problems don't just end in energy efficiency. So assuming that we have solved the technical feasibility question, 
Assuming we develop scalable grid storage technology, and an array of solar, wind, hydro, geothermal, tidal, etc., all are efficient enough to replace that fossil fuel-related energy production, and assuming we want this new grid scale to support our current and rising energy demands, to support our growing global population, and to maintain our high-consumption lifestyles. Well, that's a lot of assumptions, but in fact, unfortunately, even after all of that, there are still roadblocks to overcome. Yeah, what you're saying is, if we had the magic technology to create enough solar panels, enough wind turbines to replace every single one of our coal plants today, would we still have challenges? And yet we still have massive problems because at this point, all we have done, all we have targeted and measured are the carbon emissions at the source of energy production. We said, okay, a coal plant emits this many greenhouse gases and we can replace that with a wind farm. But what we have still failed to look at is how much environmental destruction and depletion and other sources of greenhouse gas emissions go on behind the scenes of producing, delivering, maintaining, and ultimately replacing that wind farm or that solar panel in the first place. And we need to ask, is that process sustainable? And so there's a ton that could be said on this, David, and we're not going to go in real depth here. I think this is a topic that we will have to revisit at some point, maybe look at each renewable technology separately, whether that's solar, wind, or geothermal, and really go deep on the environmental consequences, the geographical constraints, and the technical limits of each of these. But why don't we look at just one of these complications that will affect all of these, and that's the resources that we need to manufacture all these solar panels and wind farms in the first place. When it comes to the technical feasibility of renewable technology, many people simply point to the falling costs over the past decade, as well as China's massive investment in solar manufacturing, and say, well, at this rate, renewables will be more affordable and available everywhere. But this narrative fails to take into account the depletion rate of the resources needed to construct this tech in the first place. Both wind and solar technology rely on a collection of rare earth metals, 90% of which are currently sourced from China. And in 2012, the Chinese government estimated that it only had enough reserves to fuel 15 more years of this rare earth mining. In addition, all the rare earth mining going on in China has wreaked substantial environmental destruction, poisoning drinking water, poisoning farmland, and disrupting crop yields, and injecting fresh water sources with high levels of ammonia and nitrogen. It's estimated that a single ton of ore from these rare earth mines produces 200 cubic meters or 7,000 cubic feet of acidic wastewater. So here's the reality. The global demand for rare earths, which are not just used in renewable technology, but also in our electronics, our electric vehicles, our batteries, our light bulbs, all this demand has devastated the environment and left once flourishing habitats to become toxic dumps. Our demand is so high that China's black market for rare earths is two to three times larger than the legitimate market. Just go to episode 36, Slaves to Progress, to consider what that might mean for the people who are caught up in sourcing these minerals. And that's the state we are in today. Yeah, that's so much environmental destruction going on, so much human rights abuse going on just to source these rare earth minerals. And if you just look at one of these technologies, these rare earth minerals are critical for wind turbines. A single turbine uses up to 400 kilograms of neodymium and dysprosium. And today there are some 350,000 wind turbines in the world, which is a lot. But China alone had plans to construct 1 million turbines by 2050. And so if you add that up with the rest of the world, what kind of devastation are we going to leave in the wake of all this manufacturing? And then we need to consider that wind turbines typically last no more than 20 to 30 years, similar lifespans for solar panels. And so we're going to somehow replace all of these over and over and over and over, on and on every couple decades, just to keep our societies going. There's a report from the Netherlands which reveals how this small country alone will require some 11 million tons of metal to build out its clean energy infrastructure by 2050. So the five critical metals will include neodymium, terbium, indium, dysprosium, and praseodymium. And according to the report, Quote, if the rest of the world would develop renewable electricity capacity at a comparable pace with the Netherlands, a considerable shortage would arise. And even more alarming, quote, exponential growth in renewable energy production capacity is not possible with present day technologies and annual metal production. 
As an illustration, in 2050, the annual need for indium only for solar panel application will exceed the present day annual global production 12 fold. End quote. That's a lot of uh, uh, metal, David. But Daniel, like I said earlier, you know, this is assuming even that all these other problems that we're running into are taken care of. But those assumptions are still problematic at this point. One of those things is grid storage and how to store all this energy when the sun isn't shining, when the wind isn't blowing. That's a very complicated problem. We've talked about this a lot in the past on this show in episode 13, Lights Out. And the fact of the matter is, Storage technology is just not there on an efficient and cost-effective scale right now. There's lots of different ways of doing this, from lithium-ion batteries to flow batteries to gravity batteries to water pumping. They're all interesting. A lot of them are geographically dependent on where you're doing this grid storage. Some are more economical than others, but none of them are really ready for a prime-time mass deployment across the energy And that means that we have to be waiting for this technology to catch up with renewable technology in order to start really converting all of our grid over to this renewable tech. And that clock is counting down continuously while we struggle with this problem. Because every moment that we aren't on a fully renewable grid is more carbon that we need to somehow magically pump out of the air using that technology that the IPCC is depending upon in their reports that unfortunately doesn't really exist or work in an effective way at least according to their models. I think the grid storage problem um, with renewable technology really just emphasizes this fact that we're so unimaginative when it comes to solutions and that we really have built our entire economy on this this consumer economy where we need just in time everything. You know, not just goods to be delivered just in time after their manufacturing to save on costs and efficiencies, but our whole power grid is set up in this way where As energy demands increase, energy production increases. And we try to balance out demand with supply constantly because it's not possible to store electricity in our transmission and distribution lines. That's why we have giant fuses, you know, in the event that something like a lightning bolt hits our grid, that's excess energy that we need to quickly remove from the system because we simply cannot handle it. And so we've built this economy on constant energy, just-in-time production, And without this 24-7, reliable, constant stream of energy, our economy simply falls apart. And renewables doesn't work that way. It's intermittent. You can't control when the wind blows. You can't control the clouds and, and how much sun exposure you're going to get. And so the idea is, well, we need to keep this outdated economic model of just-in-time manufacturing. Um, so I guess we're going to have to invent some magic technology to help store this intermittent energy so that we can use it when we're ready for it and not when it's produced. But another way to look at that is just, well, why don't we just look at the economic side of all of this and say, why don't we transform this system that currently relies on the 24-7 input of energy and maybe shift away from this globally interdependent trade system and more to a local self-subsistence model where it's easier for communities to generate their own electricity and use it as it comes. But maybe that's a discussion for another time. Yeah, there's some really exciting developments people are working on, things like microgrids and stuff. But a lot of these problems are limited to residential energy generation. And unfortunately, that's not going to get around the needs of industry, which are much larger energy consumers in the first place. And I think it's always uh, very telling that when they construct a new windmill or put up a new solar farm, they're always mentioning the power generated in terms of X number of households. When the vast majority of power consumption is going to these other processes and not just towards turning on the light bulbs in your kitchen. You know, they are smelting aluminum. They are generating semiconductors. All this stuff is very power intensive because our technology and our lifestyle is very energy intensive. And unfortunately for this type of industry, these microgrids aren't going to work. And while neighborhoods can become self reliant in terms of their energy generation through these types of processes. And they're exciting. And I'm really uh, excited for the development in this industry and the way that it ties the community together as being responsible for their own power. It's unfortunately not going to transform the overall larger grid because the necessary way that we built our society and the efficiencies of these much larger installations, like a a giant windmill is obviously going to be much more efficient than a small personal windmill means that it's going to have to be a sort of whole-scale grid transformation if we want to really counter the carbon that we're emitting into the atmosphere and the corresponding climate change from that process. 
Yeah, so, so the main takeaway I think we want the listeners to come away from this episode with David is that these renewable technologies are not a replacement for our current greenhouse gas emitting energy production methods and that we're really going to have to transform our entire way of living. But we don't have to use our imaginations for this. Um, we can look at how countries around the world today are starting to feel the stresses associated with trying to roll out all this infrastructure for status quo economics. And one of those is Germany. Germany is one of the countries considered a leader in the development of renewable technology and a country that many point to as an example of how we can all do better. But according to Bloomberg, by 2025, Germany will have spent well over $500 billion to transform its energy system, and it will have miserably failed to reach its goals as defined by the 2016 Paris Agreement. An agreement, by the way, if you've listened to our episode number 50, Apocalypse Now, an agreement that falls short of avoiding massive warming, even if every single nation reached their pledge. Germany has until 2020 to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 40%, but in 2017 was only at 27% reduction. They have until 2020 to drop energy consumption by 20%, but have barely hit 4%. And renewable energy still represents a small share of total energy consumption. And if we take a deeper look at the share of renewables present in the German economy, we can see how we have so much more challenges to overcome to our current way of managing energy. Much of the discussion around greenhouse gas emissions is focused on the emissions that result from energy production. So think coal plants spewing carbon dioxide in the air. And while energy production is a significant source of these greenhouse gases, in Germany's case is 35% of their total GHGs, that still leaves two-thirds of our economies that are emitting these greenhouse gases. This is things like transportation, agriculture, residential sectors, and more. And many of these sectors can be really difficult to transition to clean sources of energy. In Germany, transportation represents a 20% share of GHG emissions, and renewable technology represents just 4% of the energy consumed for transportation. Mining and manufacturing, another big source of GHG emissions, also just gets 4% of their energy from these renewables. And so all this goes back to our initial discussion, which is that if energy generation represents just one-third of our GHG emissions, then when we only look at renewable technology as a way to replace our coal plants, our fossil fuel industries, while continuing to grow our industrial sectors, while growing the automotive and commercial airline industries, and while we continue to encourage export-led development, well, then our GHG emissions will continue to outpace whatever reductions that occur in that energy sector. Another country is China, one of the biggest drivers of solar power deployment worldwide. And China's commitment to subsidizing the solar industry at home and exporting a majority of the world's supply of solar panels has been a big driver of investment in solar technology worldwide. However, a 2018 decision by China to stop subsidizing solar projects unless they can compete with coal in terms of energy prices, could change that and have a dramatic impact on solar technology around the world. Already, as a result, we've seen a global dip in investment and spending on renewable technology. In 2018, China spent 32% less on clean energy than they did in 2017. And for solar, that was a 53% reduction. And as a result, global spending on renewables was down 8% in 2018 from 2017. And as we alluded to, if we build out a massive infrastructure of renewables to keep this economy growing, we still run into the problem of having to replace all those materials every 20 to 30 years, which will simply just delay the inevitable death cycles and in infrastructure that we're already seeing. Once again, Germany provides an insightful example. The country has some 30,000 wind turbines in operation, and the operational costs of these have been subsidized since 2000, so long as they're supplying energy to the grid. But in 2020, next year, those subsidies will end. And wind farm operators will have to pay their own costs out of the revenues they make from selling energy. The only problem is that at current energy prices, many of these wind turbines will not be profitable because they've aged. And as they've aged, they've become more expensive to maintain. And one estimate is that over 25% of land-based wind power in Germany will have to be decommissioned. And that means taking the turbines down 
removing the concrete foundation, which alone can cost hundreds of thousands of euros. And then there are the blades to deal with, which poses a huge problem because they're completely not recyclable at the moment. Many wind turbine blades are a mixture of carbon fiber and glass that gets cemented with polyester resin, and the blades cannot be separated once that resin sets, which means you can't recycle the components that went into making it. And even things like incineration is untenable because <laughs> when you try to burn these uh, turbines, they end up clogging the, ins- the filters in these incinerator plants. We've talked about this sort of problem before, Daniel, way back in episode five into the road, discussing the problems that happen when we are having to maintain our expensive infrastructure as it decays and ages. We see a lot of economic benefit for building a road or a new wind turbine for the first time. But when it comes to making sure that that wind turbine or that road is safe, maintained and continuing to generate energy or allow cars to drive by, Well, then that economic return is starting to decline, especially when it comes to having to completely replace this turbine or this road or this bridge or whatever it is. And it starts adding up. These costs increase as time goes on. And a lot of times in the United States, especially, we've just tried to ignore this and hope the problem will fix itself. And that has meant that a lot of roads are, in fact, being torn out and replaced with gravel roads, with dirt roads. Bridges are allowed to just be unsafe until they collapse and cars can't drive on them at all anymore. Then at some point, they're returned and replaced. And the same thing is going to end up happening to this aging energy generation infrastructure. The first time you build a windmill, you're seeing a positive effect. You're seeing the economic incentive of developing something that's generating power for the first time, whether it's replacing old carbon emitting technologies or whether it's generating even more power that you can use to spur this economic development. But when you have to rip down that windmill and rebuild it in the same place, you aren't gaining anything new. You're just emitting a cost in order to maintain the status quo. And our economy and the way our world is set up is not built to do that. And this is another reason why we have to be looking at changing our very relationship with economic growth if we want to be able to even have a chance of establishing a renewable energy world. Which brings us to the tail end of this episode, David, where we haven't gone too in-depth in terms of technical details about renewable technology, but I hope we've, we've provided some concepts to think about as you hear our politicians and our companies Uh, bragging about the renewable technology they're investing in or the jobs they're creating. We need to start thinking about what's really going on behind the scenes. What is that power being used to do? Um, You know, at the end of the day, like you mentioned in the beginning, the technologies for renewable energy are beautiful. A solar panel is a wonderful thing. And the idea of replacing a reliance on coal or oil with the sun is wonderful. We would never here on Ashes Ashes discourage that. But to look at the world today and imagine everything the same, the same overabundance of cheap electronic gadgets, automobiles, shopping malls, the same suburban sprawl, the same systems that exploit the global south, the same systems of economic growth and pursuit of profit accumulation. To imagine a solar panel as the solution for keeping the status quo going is not merely a lack of imagination. It's a gross corruption of everything these renewables stand for. To understand that our industrial expansion and consumer economies are destroying the world and then conclude that we can solve the problem by eliminating energy production source greenhouse gas emissions through a great blanket of concrete upon which tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of giant steel turbines will sit. That is to perform a mental calculation that lacks any sense of reality. A transition to renewable energy must be accompanied by a commitment to renewable living and to a scaling back of economies broadly. And so we need to join hands with others around us. We need to recognize that we live in a society and we can use the power that comes from being a part of that society to make change happen. And we can realize that individually and as communities, it's not our fault this great, wasteful world that has arisen. It's not our fault that companies are pillaging the earth. It's not our fault that we live in food deserts, that we have to buy products made through exploitation, that we have to breathe air twice as dense with carbon dioxide than levels our bodies are adapted for. We as individuals did not create this world, but together we can change the systems in which our individual lives take place. We don't want cell phones made from slaves, but one individual boycotting Apple is unlikely to make a difference. 
But working together to change the laws of the economy such that a factory is owned by the workers themselves, not some individual billionaire halfway around the world, that would make an immediate difference. If we work together locally, nationally, and internationally, advocating for systemic changes to the destructive war path of the global economy, then we will simultaneously be creating a world of less and abundance. Yes, there might be less consumption. We might use less energy. We might not drive as much. There will be fewer businesses pandering to the super rich to ship their wardrobes everywhere they go. But whatever pain this might cause will be more than made up for in an abundance of pride, an abundance of confidence, abundance of mutual aid and social relationships as we see our collective work remake and reshape the world. As you said in episode 55, what we can do, David, when we are alone, we are defeated, but together our actions multiply and together we can make change happen. Also, there's a great article published in Nature Energy that discusses the social justice impacts of energy projects and ways to correct what for a long time has been a complete neglect of community inclusion and justice considerations in these huge energy investments. And it's really important. And we encourage you to give it a read. We'll provide a link on our website. You might have to use Sci-Hub to get around the paywall. If you don't know how to do that, send us an email. And it's important because going back to that case study from Oaxaca, people's lives and the environment are affected by investment and development. And we desperately need to abandon the idea of this technocratic process that uses data and objective economic thought to deliver solutions around the world. That does not exist. And we allow our hubris to blind us to the social realities of these investments when we ignore the social justice considerations. Anyway, give it a read, and I suppose that's a lot to think about, David. As always, Daniel, but think about it. We hope you will. You can find that article, all the other sources that we used in this episode, as well as a full transcript of this show on our website at ashesashes.org. As always, a lot of time and research goes into making these episodes possible. And we will never use advertising to support this show. So if you like it, would like us to keep going, you, our listener, can support us by giving us a review, recommending us to a friend, discussing these issues with your community, and supporting us on patreon.com slash ashes ashes cast. And if you join our Patreon support, visit us in our Discord channel where we hang out uh, at least once a day. You can be a part of that discussion and, and join with other listeners around the world of this show so we can get this little community growing. Right, David? That's the magic word, Daniel. (laughs) Send us an email at contact at ashesashes.org. You can also find us on your favorite social media network at Ashes Ashes Cast. Next week, we've got another great episode, and we hope you'll tune in for that. But until then, this is Ashes Ashes. Bye. Bye Bye-bye.